All right, I am going to start now. Um, so, like I said earlier, it will be mainly about cardiac output. So, here's the thing, I will start with a question just to, uh, you know, put you in the, in the talk. So, what's the best technique of assessing cardiac output? I realize some of you have more background than others, depending on your level. Uh, but those are generally, those three are generally the, the modalities of cardiac output measurements we use in the lab. True FIC, assumed FIC, and thermodilution, and I will go over them. And there is other. So we'll go back to this question a little later. So I want to go over the FIC equation for cardiac output calculation. This is a very important equation, and there are at at least about four equations, at least four equations in hemodynamics that you need to memorize and know very well. This is one of them. So you need to understand it well. Thick equation, I'll go over it uh, quickly. Some of you, I think most of you already know it, but basically it says, it's, a, it, it's based on a simple concept. The concept is O2 consumption is the difference between how much the arteries are delivering versus how much is coming back through the vein. The difference between the two is whatever is consumed by the tissues, which makes sense. Now, the calculation of arterial O2 delivery and venous O2 return, arterial O2 delivery is equal to the cardiac output, which is in liter of blood per minute, multiplied by the arterial O2 content, which is milliliter of oxygen per liter of blood. If you multiply those two, you can see that this ends up being milliliter of O2 per minute. The liter of blood goes away. So cardiac output by how much oxygen there is in every liter of blood. That gives you the arterial O2 delivery in milliliter per minute. Same thing on the venous side, cardiac output by venous O2 return or delivery if you want. So further details, what is arterial O2 content? So we know, so arterial O2 delivery is cardiac output by arterial O2 content. Arterial O2 content is arterial O2 saturation multiplied by hemoglobin, multiplied by how much every gram of hemoglobin can carry oxygen. Okay, so if you have 90%, 80% O2 sat by hemoglobin of 12, by this is a constant, 1.36. Multiply by 10, this is to uh, adjust for the units uh, to make this in milliliter, otherwise it will be in deciliter. So this is arterial O2 content. Venous O2 content is the same, except we use SVO2, which is mixed venous oxygen, okay? So therefore, if you plug all those, you end up with O2 consumption equal SaO2 by hemoglobin by 1.36 by cardiac output minus SVO2 by hemoglobin by 1.36 by cardiac output. Then you flip it, cardiac output becomes equal to O2 consumption divided by this equation, okay? Uh, so that's easy. All you need to deliver to, to find out is those two, especially the mixed venous O2. So the FIC equation is very much dependent on mixed venous O2, as well as on obtaining what is the O2 consumption. The true FIC that is still done in some cath lab, the true FIC equation consists of directly measuring O2 consumption. You measure the O2 consumption by put, placing a hood a metabolic hood over the patient's head, and basically you measure how much this patient is, uh, how much oxygen the patient is breathing in, and how much he's breathing out over the course of a minute, and then you know how much oxygen he's consumed over the course of the minute. This is used, by the way, for some of you who know that, in what we call cardiopulmonary exercise testing, where you do treadmill and you measure oxygen consumption. Uh, that's kind of the same technique. It doesn't have to be a hood. There are a variety of, uh, uh, of tools used um, 
for that purpose, but that's how it's done. And that's how it can be done in the lab. And that's the best way of doing cardiac output is to measure O2 consumption with a hood and measure mixed venous O2 and arterial O2, then it's easy to calculate. So try to memorize this. It's a very important equation. Uh, okay, so most often in the lab, we don't, in most labs, they don't calculate a true fake cardiac output. They calculate what we call assumed fake, mainly meaning we don't measure O2 consumption. We assume it's a certain number. And that number is derived from the patient size, body surface area, or weight. So this is the assumed con con consumption, 125 milliliter per minute per meter square. That's the most commonly used. Um, some software would use 110 for the elderly over 70 years old. Some would use it, would use the um, consumption per kilogram. The problem is that any assumption you use is fairly inaccurate. You know, half the time it doesn't match the true fake. And in maybe a quarter of the time, it's significantly. In a quarter of the time, it's over 25% different from the true fake. So it's a very, um, it has a lot of pitfalls. And here I will go over some of them. Since we use it so much, I want you to understand what the problem is or are, what the problems are with the assumed fake. So one problem is it can underestimate true cardiac output. Here, this equation assumes the patient is very relaxed. He's uh, in like metabolic state one or two. So you don't want him to be fully awake or anxious or talking while having it done or agitated. It certainly underestimates a true cardiac output and O2 consumption in a septic patient. Sepsis is a form of stress, is a form of exercise. So if you're calculating cardiac output in a septic patient, that equation will very much underestimate the true cardiac output. On the other hand, probably more often than not, it over, overestimate the true cardiac output. One case is the elderly, El, you know, the metabolism um, goes down with age and the elderly patient has lower O2 consumption. Obese patient, to under, uh, overestimated in obese patient simply because, you know, the fat tissue is not as metabolically active as the rest of the cells and you know, multiplying by a big body surface area that is mostly fat, you end up, that equation ends up overestimating what uh, his consumption is. Uh, but you can adjust for that, use what we call ideal body weight, but again, that will, in that case, it will underestimate it. So it's difficult. That's another important one for us, heart failure. A heart failure patient, as you know, I hope, they have reduced peak O2 consumption, what we call peak VO2, okay? They have reduced peak O2 consumption with exercise, but some of the, uh, but they do have for a significant proportion of heart failure, mainly compensated heart failure. They have normal O2 consumption at rest. That said, the advanced heart failure, especially advanced heart failure with reduced CF, they do have reduced O2 consumption at rest. So this number will overestimate. Um, their cardiac output. Also patient receiving oxygen. That's a very important one. And that's one reason why we don't like patients to have oxygen while we make, we're making uh, cath lab measurements, especially uh, O2 saturation measurements in the lab. Um, because oxygen, and I'll explain it a little bit uh, little later on, oxygen will increase Mix for the same type of O2 delivery, oxygen will increase mixed venous O2 more than it will increase arterial O2, simply because of uh, mixed venous O2 being lower than arterial O2, it is on the steep portion of the hemoglobin dissociation curve. So it will raise SVO2 more and therefore it will affect that equation. This by the way applies to true or assumed fig for both. Uh, it will make the cardiac output look uh, better than it truly is when you give oxygen. So you give oxygen, you may make the cardiac output look better by making this denominator smaller. So be careful with those. This is a, a paper a few years ago showing the problems with this equation in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Interestingly, in that paper, they, even, they didn't just use that equation I mentioned 
they tried to use other equations that are just for age and sex, uh, which you would think will make it better, but even those other equation, equations still had a problem and a discrepancy with the true O2 consumption. So this was for the FIC. I hope everybody understood it um, to a degree. If somebody has a question about it, I mean, you can interrupt me if, if you want. If somebody has a question now, uh, I think I'm fine with it. Uh, all right. If not, I hope everybody understood it. So the other technique that we use is thermodilution. Now, I want you to understand it well in detail. Um, so here's the thing, you all know, I hope the Swan catheter, I'll go over it very quickly. Basically you have a blue port, or let's say the other three ports. You have a three ports that connect to the distal tip and one port that connect 30 centimeter away from the distal tip. So the three ports, this is the most important port that we use to measure pressure and that connects to the distal tip. You have the balloon connects to the distal tip and allows us to wedge the catheter. You have the thermistor uh, port that has uh, wires that go all the way to the distal tip and allow measurement of the distal tip uh, temperature. All those, by the way, are you know, not communicating with each other. Those are separate catheters inside it, separate lumens inside it. Then you have this fourth one, which is 30 centimeter away from the tip, which ends in the right atrium if you are if the tip is in the PA, okay? So uh, here, is what, here is how we do thermodilution. We inject 10 milliliter of, of uh, saline, cold saline or cold dextrose in the proximal port, which goes into the RA. It has to be cold. Then the thermistor, this one, will measure how that temperature is changing with time uh, at the PA level. Basically, let's say the assumption is you inject 10 milliliter of uh, cold saline, let's say 65 degree room temperature saline, and you'll see how the temperature changes. You know, the body temperature is 97, 98. Uh, so it's very important to realize what assum assumptions are made. One, the assumption is that you're injecting 10 cc instantaneously, okay? So if you inject slowly, that will create errors in that equations, and I'll explain how. Two, it's assuming that you're injecting cold or somewhat cold saline. If you warm up that saline in your hand for a long time, if that temperature is not that cold, if it is 75 degrees, 80 degrees, if it is closer to the body temperature, well, it will readily warm up as soon as you inject it, as soon as it contacts the blood, and it's not going to create significant temperature changes, or if it does create them, they will be very damp. So assuming you're injecting 10 cc at of cold saline instantaneously, the temperature change will be detected by the thermistor. And this is, let's say, the normal cardiac output. It's fairly sharp. If you have a very low cardiac output, you will see a very low, very slow and sluggish temperature change, which leads to actually a large area under the curve. This should be larger than this area under the curve. And the larger the area under the curve, the lower the cardiac output. Okay, high cardiac output will make it more peaked uh, of a pressure. And, and actually, uh, the peak is oftentimes lower than the normal cardiac output. Uh, this is the true equation. You don't need to know it, but you can see this is a denominator of the true equation. is how the temperature is the integral of how the temperature is changing with time. It's, this denominator is actually the surface area of the thermodilution curve. Okay, and this is the V1 is the volume you're injecting. The soft, you can inject any volume for that equation, but the software we use and every lab use, uses assume a 10 milliliter injection. So you have to inject 10, not nine, not 11. So it has to be accurate. Um, 
so I will go back to this and mention some other caveats. Now, even assuming you're injecting, so I, I said you need to inject, assuming you, inj let's say the example where you inject slowly rather than injecting as instantaneously, you inject two, three cc's per second. Well, you will spread out this curve by the fact that you're injecting it slowly. Again, the equation assumes everything is coming immediately, instantaneously. So you inject it slowly, you'll spread out that curve and you'll create a falsely low correct output. You can try it, by the way, on the next case. Try a couple where you do it differently. Try also injecting 5cc and see what happens. Now, there is another important pitfall unrelated to you. Even if we put 10 cc of cold saline immediately, if the patient has a low cardiac output, very low cardiac output, let's say two liters, uh, one and a half liters a minute, that cold saline will warm up with the blood as it's traveling slowly to the PA. It will warm up before it gets to the PA. And as a result, it will create a narrower curve than you would have expected, okay? You know, because it's uh, because it already warmed up. So the curve will be much sharper than this. And so if you have a very low cardiac output, thermodilution may overestimate the true cardiac output. That's not something you can account for. I think what you need to do is ensure it's really cold. You know, don't warm it much in your hands. And it, in the past, people used to do it with, um, the syringe is placed in ice cold, and that will be actually the one least likely to cause error. Um, all right, so I, you know, gave you an idea about this. I want you to realize, uh, so some of the caveats, I mentioned there are probably four major caveats of thermodilution. Um, but realize that despite all the caveats, Thermodilution is a, overall a very accurate method of estimating the cardiac output, and it's the one that approximates true FIC the most. True FIC is better, but this is second to it, thermodilution. It's certainly better than assumed FIC. It, usually the error is between this and the true FIC is about five to 10%, so it's an acceptable range. So some of the caveat where um, that, that where the difference between thermodilution and true FIC is exaggerated are those. I mentioned the low cardiac output. Another caveat is tricuspid regurgitation. Now this is a controversial, controversial one. I think all textbook will mention tricuspid regurgitation. Imagine when you inject the cold saline here, if you have a tricuspid regurgitation, that um, injectate will keep recirculating, recirculating, and it will create a sluggish curve of low output. But in truth, you know, severe tricuspid regurgitation does create a severely low cardiac output. So at least half the paper that studied thermodilution and tricuspid regurgitations showed that, uh, the, you know, tricuspid regurgitation does not affect thermodilution cardiac output. The, the low output you obtain is actually a truly low output because of the tricuspid regurgitation, truly low forward output. So I'm not usually very worried about tricuspid regurgitation, unlike most people. And even if you do underestimate it, it's not by much. So I'm not very worried about this one. Now, this is a big one, shunts. That's a huge one. And that's, I, I think that's the biggest caveat. This is a case where thermodilution is absolutely useless if you have shunt, significant shunt. Uh, so, and, and with significant or two step up. We'll go over shunt in the future, but why does shunt affect that? Here's the thing, if you have a shunt, let's say you have a left to right shunt, a big left to right shunt, that left to right shunt, a shunt will, will massively dilute whatever you're injecting, okay? Will damp its temperature so much that Oftentimes, you know, even you can't even obtain a temperature curve because it warms it so much. You get most often, if you have a really big left to right shunt, you get absolutely no thermodilution curve. And if you do get one, it's wrong and flat. Uh, same with the right to left shunt. You will be losing a lot of the a lot of the saline you're injecting. That will also, um, you know, prevent you from having a proper curve. 
So shunt is a major caveat. Another interesting thing, even let's say theoretically you get in shunt, you get a measurement. This measurement is inaccurate, but importantly, that measurement is not left-sided output. You have to realize this is a QP. Remember in shunt, the right output is different from the left output. It's a QP on the right and QS on the left. So when the thermodilution in a shunt case is measuring QP, not QS. So keep that in mind. But again, I would ignore it fully. Uh, another caveat is rhythm irregularities. Uh, remember, thermodilution measures cardiac output over a few seconds only. So if you have a fib, um, you know, depending what, what cycle, or what part of the AFib cycle you're falling in, um, you may uh, very much underestimate or overestimate the true cardiac output that's average over a minute, okay? Uh, so again, keep those ideas in mind. Stroke volume is not constant with, um, with AFib. The short RR interval lowers cardiac output more than the long RR makes up for it. That's kind of an idea, you know. If you shrink, uh, take, a, take an RR interval of, let's say, um, 500 milliseconds, okay, which is maybe uh, 110 beats a minute. If you prolong that, or let's take it, sorry, 600 milliseconds, 100 beats a minute. If you prolong it by 10 milliseconds, you will increase stroke volume more than if more than shortening it by 10 seconds will, will change the stroke volume. So, you know, that's why the irregularities makes it very difficult to make measurements. You know, the short segment does not compensate for the longer segment. Uh, but if you're not fast, then the RR variability actually, you know, uh, the changes in RR affect the stroke volume in a predictable percent. So they, they compensate for each other. So you can do it when the rate is controlled. Any other questions? So this is another thing. I, I, I haven't been to the ICU here, but I assume you have those catheters uh, where, you get, where you obtain uh, continuous cardiac output. I think all institutions have those. So how do you get, I don't know if some of you know, how do you get continuous cardiac output? It uses actually thermodilution technique and it gives you on that machine, it gives you continuous cardiac output and continuous mixed venous O2. It uses thermodilution technique, yet nobody's injecting saline in that case. So what it relies on, instead of using cold saline, and you will notice those swans have a filament that we don't have on the typical swans we use in the cath lab. It has this filament um, about 15 centimeter from the tip, a 10 centimeter thermal filament. This filament heats up the blood every minute and it uses basically warm, it's as if you're using warm saline to measure and that warm uh, blood or the blood that has been warmed you will assess the temperature change thanks to that at the tip, okay? And how does it get warm? That's why also you will notice that those swans have two, uh, have two port, two electrical port. One of them is a standard electrical port that connects to the tip and measure the temperature. Another one is the heater. So this one is connected to the heater. It heats the blood every minute and it allows you to measure the cardiac output. It's actually a good method and it, um, it's fairly accurate, unless you know the swan has been there for several days and you have a lot of debris built up at the tip that damage the thermistor. It's a fairly accurate method simply because you're repeating it so many times, so you're obtaining a nicer sampling. Um, all right, I hope everybody understood that. Also, that type of swan gives you, you know, normally for arterial O2 sat, we just withdraw from the tip. But this swan gives you continuous venous O2 because it has a wire, a fiber optic wire connected to the tip and it measures PA sat continuously like you would measure um, transcutaneous O2 sat on the finger. 
Again, the swan has to be clear and not have too much debris on its tip. All right. So I, I will go back to my first question that I ask here. You know, what is the best technique of assessing cardiac output? In my opinion, the best technique is the other, which is mixed venous O2 saturation. And here's, here's the concept. So from the Fick equation, this is the mixed venous O2. And this is, in my opinion, again, the best way of assessing whether cardiac output is accurate, regardless of the conditions. Uh, and that's easier to obtain, less subject to error and to variability. So you need to know the normal uh, values for this. And you need to know why. I think a lot of you already know, but for those of you who don't, uh, imagine, you know, imagine a sedated person, okay? He has a low cardiac, sedated old person, 85 years old. He has a cardiac output of four, okay? But his, meta, you know, his metabolism is low and he's sleeping, so he doesn't need a lot of oxygen. And since he doesn't need a lot of oxygen, he's not going to be consuming a lot of the oxygen that is delivered. And therefore the mixed venous O2 is not going to be low. Imagine a, somebody running with a cardiac output of four liter per minute. The tissues are avid for oxygen and they will be extracting avidly oxygen from that four liter per minute of cardiac output and the mixed venous O2, so they will be extracting so much oxygen and not much oxygen will be left for the venous circulation. And their mixed venous, his mixed venous O2 will be very low, maybe 35, 30%. So the same four liters per minute for an old sedated person is very accurate and his mixed venous O2 would be 70%. Whereas for a young person running, it's extremely inaccurate. So this is why mixed venous O2 is an important number because it basically tells you how well the cardiac output matches the body demands, the tissue demands for oxygen. And that's why it's such an important measure. It's hard to really interpret cardiac output in absolute, what it means, because you know, it, the important thing about cardiac output, it has to match your demands. The same thing is in septic sepsis or septic shock specifically. You can have a cardiac output of eight liters per minute, but that's not enough for a septic patient. So then mixed venous O2 may be 55% with a cardiac output of eight liters a minute because the tissues are absorbing a lot of that oxygen delivered. So not much is coming back or not much is left for that venous circulation. So you understand the concept. I hope everybody understand it, understands it. There are some caveats. I will go over them quickly, but just know that, and really that's probably the most important number in regard to cardiac output assessment. Now, what are the normal values? The normal is, it's normally over 65, uh, over 65%, yes, 65 to 80%. Meaning normally on average, if you combine all tissues together, they extract anywhere between 20 to 35% of the oxygen that they receive. And that ends up, so they ex you get 100%, you extract 20, you know, 20 to 35% of the arterial oxygen, and you end up with 65 to 80% arterial uh, venous saturation. So remember that number is very important, okay? Now again, this is a number at rest. This is the normal, the 65 to 80% for somebody resting. The normal for exercise is different because when you exercise, your cardiac output increases, but your oxygen consumption, even for a normal individual, your cardiac output increases three times, four times, but your oxygen consumption may increase eight, 10 times. So your oxygen consumption increases more than the cardiac output can afford to give you. So the mixed venous O2 with exercise is normally lower than that. Is normal, it can be, you know, as low, I won't go over the details, I can give that another time, but it could be as low as 40% or so with exercise. So again, this is at rest. That's how much the tissue can absorb up to 35%.
uh, can extract, I should say, up to 35%, okay? Now, so it's this uh, mixed venous O2 directly reflects how cardiac output matches the peripheral O2 demand. But keep in mind, mixed venous O2 also reflects hemoglobin and arterial oxygenation. So assuming the oxygen, the hemoglobin and the arterial oxygenation is good, then mixed venous O2 correlates very well, very well with the uh, tissue demands, with, with how well the cardiac output is matching the tissue demand. But assuming if somebody is very anemic, then the mixed venous O2 will drop because again, you have less O2 delivery. Anything that affects the O2 delivery will drop mixed venous O2. And O2 delivery is dependent on cardiac output, hemoglobin, and arterial O2 saturation, okay? This is the, ar the arterial O2 delivery, is dependent on those, okay? So anything that drops the arterial O2 delivery for the tissues to make the same O2 consumption, they will have to extract more oxygen and the venous O2 sat will drop more. So if you're severely anemic, let's say somebody with a hemoglobin of seven, your mixed venous O2 will be low. So you can, that doesn't correlate with cardiac output anymore. Same with somebody who's hypoxic 80%, then of course the mixed venous O2 will be low and doesn't correlate well with cardiac output. Uh, so keep that in mind. Another important thing that I mentioned earlier is high flow oxygen therapy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if, you, if somebody is on high flow oxygen, what I mean by high flow over two liters of oxygen. So, or on, on non-rebreather or face mask and those things. So when you're on uh, high flow oxygen, it's interesting, you know, high flow oxygen will increase the arterial O2 delivery it will increase the arterial O2 content and it will help potentially with O2 consumption. The only problem is that it will raise mixed venous O2 disproportionately to cardiac output and more sharply than arterial O2 um, saturation, simply because the mixed venous O2, like I explained earlier, is on the steep portion of the hemoglobin dissociation curve. Uh, so it will rise more sharply. Let's say if without oxygen, this patient ve mixed venous O2 is 45. You give him oxygen, high flow oxygen, for the same cardiac output, that mixed venous O2 may go up to 55%, even though the cardiac output has not changed. Now, to some degree, that still um, correlates to some degree with the fact that the tissues are getting more oxygen. So in that regard, it's not uh, very... Um, it is still appropriate to a degree that it, you know, it tells you the tissues are getting more uh, better oxygenation, but it does not correlate at all with cardiac output anymore. Another thing, you know, I, I should mention it here is that I'll go back to the Fick equation. It's all driven by that. So I told you this is how we measure the arterial O2 content and mix and venous O2 content. It's really based on how much the hemoglobin carries oxygen. Keep in mind that 1.5% of, of oxygen is carried as dissolved in the blood. It's only 1.5%, so that's why we ignore it in that simplified equation. But the more you give somebody oxygen and the more the hemoglobin gets saturated, the more that dissolved portion goes up. And in that case, that will make the Fick equation less accurate. When you give somebody oxygen, the dissol dissolved hemoglobin becomes a more important component that kind of destroys that whole equation. That's another reason why we don't like to give oxygen. Um, again, it will falsely raise mixed venous O2 and it will totally affect the Fick equation. Again, we use it. I'm not saying we don't use it. You just need to know that you start to have a lot of caveat. And you need to try to make the patient off oxygen during the case, if the saturation allows, if the saturation is 90% and if, or more. And if you do use oxygen, try to limit it to less than two. The more you use, the more oxygen you use, the more caveats you have. The worst case scenario is if you give 
oxygen to somebody who's arterial O2 sat is normal at rest, at ambient air. This is where you will get most errors because this is the case where you will get the most amount of dissolved O2, uh, non-hemoglobin bound O2 in the blood. So keep that, uh, you know, keep those ideas in mind. And this is the case where you get the most inappropriate rise of mixed venous O2 as well. All right, now, I hope everybody understood those concepts. Um, if somebody has a question, you can ask. Otherwise, I want to, uh, you know, elaborate a little more on that mixed venous O2 idea. All right, so here's one important question. What is mixed venous? What is mixed venous O2? I've been talking about it now for uh, over 20, 30 minutes. So mixed venous O2, is it RPA sat, RA sat, or SVC sat? Anybody knows or anybody want to throw an answer? Maybe a first year fellow? I think it can be the RA as long as there is no step up from a left to right hand? Well, okay. Well, the best answer is the PA, not the RA. Because here's the thing. So what is mixed venous O2 for the body? Mixed venous O2 is basically an integration of the venous blood coming from all sources, from the IVC, SVC, and very importantly, from that coronary sinus that we sometimes forget about. So as we see IVC and coronary sinus. Coronary sinus, which corresponds to the coronary circulation is only about 5%, but it's important. I'll explain in a little bit why it's important. Uh, which by the way, 5% corresponds to how much cardiac output goes to the coronary artery in case you want to know. That's an important number to know. So anyway, in the right atrium, all those three sources, sources are swirling around with each other. And depending where you sample the right atrium, you don't achieve a good mixing in the right atrium. And your catheter may be close to the SVC or to the SVC swirl, to the IVC or to the coronary sinus. And so your RA sat is not a good representation of, um, the, of the average mixed venous O2. Uh, especially the coronary sinus, the, what is the mix, what is the venous O2 content or venous O2 saturation of the coronary sinus? Anybody knows? Even higher level. Like I gave you for on average, the mixed venous O2, let's say 70%. Okay, what's the mix, what is the venous O2 of the coronary sinus? Anybody can tell? it's only 30 to 40%. The idea here is that the heart is the tissue that extracts the more oxygen, relatively speaking. So while the average tissue extract, like I said, up to 35% oxygen, the heart extract 70% oxygen. So the O2 sat of the heart is lot, a lot lower. It's about 30 to 40%. The O2 sat of the vein, venous blood, like coronary sinus, cardiac venous blood is a lot lower. It's only about 30, 40%, okay? So that explains why if you sample uh, the right atrium next to the coronary sinus, you might, you might obtain a number that's extremely low. Uh, that one doesn't represent the mixed venous O2. Second, it may create a false impression of a shunt. So you have to be careful with that. When you sample the right atrium, you have to sample at multiple levels in the right atrium. You have to obtain at least three samples. But importantly, if you're just doing it to assess cardiac output and PA sat and, and, um, and cardiac output and mixed venous sat, the most important uh, chamber is the PA chamber. RV is the second best. Okay, now I want to um, mention another important idea. Should you decide to use the right atrium, you have to obtain, um, or, or should you decide to use right atrium? Yeah, you have to obtain multiple samples. But better than using right atrium, if you don't want to use the PA, you can use SVC and IVC, sample both and average them using this equation, okay? Which gives more weight to the SVC. 
and I'll explain it. It's important to understand that. Now, why does this equation give more weight to the SVC rather than the IVC? That's one question. Another question is, maybe start by answering that one. What is the highest venous O2 sat, SVC, IVC, or coronary sinus? So I mentioned already, coronary sinus sat is the lowest, okay? It's only 30, 40%. How about between SVC and IVC? Which one is the lowest oxygen saturation? Which one of the two is lower? SVC is lower. Yes, that's true. And why is that? Because uh, uh, like renal consumption of oxygen is less, which contributes to the IVC. Excellent, excellent answer. That's, that's uh, true. The, um, the absolute renal oxygen consumption is actually high, but the, the kidneys also get a very high cardiac output of 20%. So eventually, uh, the percent extraction of that big cardiac output they receive is very low. It's one of the lowest in the body. It's, you know, maybe 10% compared to the heart, which extracts 70%. So that's the reason. So the venous blood coming from the kidneys is very low in oxygen, is very high in oxygen. And that's why the IVC blood is higher in oxygen than the SVC. Some people think it's because the brain uses more oxygen. That's not correct. But you can memorize it this way. I think for some people, it's easier to memorize. SVC sat is lower because the brain uses more oxygen. It's incorrect, but you can use that to memorize it. Okay? So you got it. So we understand those. Now, how come, if you look back, most of the cardiac output is from the lower body, a little more than the upper body. Yet this equation, so, you know, you, you think that if you want to get uh, mixed venous O2 from the SVC and IVC, you should average them. One plus one divided by two. Why does this equation gives, give more weight to the SVC than the IVC? Anybody knows? I think maybe because it, it compensates for the coronary sinus draw, like the low oxygen saturation in the coronary sinus. So the SVC will be closer to the total. Excellent. After the three. Excellent, excellent. You're right. So good job. Even though the coronary sinus is only 5%, it's so hypoxic that, yes, that's one reason why to compensate for that, more weight is given to the SVC uh, than to the IVC, simply because again, the SVC is more hypoxic than the IVC. So giving it more weight, compensate for the coronary sinus. In truth, I don't like that. I, I, you know, I looked back, those equations were validated in the 60s. Nobody has ever studied, nobody has studied that since then. And in a paper that there is, more recent, it's only 1976, but it is more recent. It actually found that that equation is one of the worst. It actually found that giving more weight to the IVC better correlates with the PA sat. So, you know, I have a problem with it. I like to use, at least not give it so much weight. I like to use two SVC plus one IVC divided by three. Uh, again, just because it's such an old equation that, has, that was validated on 18 patients and never validated again since the 60s. So another thing uh, I want to mention here, uh, no, not this one. Uh, yes, in exercise, okay, I want to mention that important idea, interesting. In exercise, uh, in running exercise, where do you think, so I asked earlier, uh, what is higher, SVC or IVC? And we agreed SVC is lower than IVC. Now, if you're running, which O2 sat is lower, IVC or SVC? So the answer here- I assume is, IVC because of the yeah. ox increased oxygen consumption by the lower extremity muscles, which Absolutely. are okay. Absolutely. And that applies to a lot of shock states. And that's important for us when you're bringing a patient with cardiogenic shock. Um, IVC saturation may become lower than, frequently becomes lower than SVC saturation, simply because the brain is protected. So it doesn't lose a whole, uh, doesn't lose a whole lot of O2 extraction. 
whereas the mesenteric area is not protected, it loses a lot of the, its O2 consumption, uh, and oh, sorry, O2 delivery, so it ends up using a lot more oxygen because it's, it's not getting a lot of blood. So in shock state, IVC, which is normally higher, becomes lower. So a lot of the patients we cath, IVC sat will be lower than SVC. And this is another case where this equation becomes totally useless. In those cases, if anything, you should give more weight to the IVC. So in shock state, you should not use those equations. You should probably use one plus one or even two plus one, two IVC plus one SVC. So keep that in mind too. That's an important idea. I hope I'm not overwhelming you, but I do want you to know those. We measure PA sat so much every single day. You, you need to understand those numbers. It's physiology, but it's really so important. I want to just quickly give you one thing. I, I, that's another, I mentioned four equations to memorize. This is a second one to memorize. It's the vascular resistant equation. Uh, it's, it relies on the arm law, which is delta voltage equal resistance by intensity, which translates into delta pressure equal resistance by karak output. You need to know it very well. Uh, and delta pressure is the inflow pressure minus the outflow pressure. So when we're talking systemic vascular resistance, the inflow pressure is the arterial pressure. The outflow pressure is the RA pressure. You know, blood is pumped from the aorta to the RA eventually, that's the outflow. So it's mean blood pressure minus RA pressure divided by karak output multiplied by 80 for the international unit. PVR is, is again, what's going through the pulmonary circulation is mean PA pressure minus the output, the outflow, which is LA pressure divided by karak output. This is very important. They ask it on board almost every single year general cardiology board. So you read in one way or another. So you need to memorize it well. We don't multiply by 80. This gives you the wood unit, uh, PVR. Now, if you don't have LA pressure, of course, we use wedge pressure, mean wedge pressure, which as I mentioned uh, last time, it correlates well with uh, mean LA pressure. Or you can use LVEDP as well, despite some discrepancy, but it's a reasonable discrepancy and you can use it. You need to know the normal number. Uh, we use a three woods as a cutoff, and this used to separate precapillary from postcapillary pulmonary hypertension. I think, beside PVR, I mentioned uh, the other time using the gradient between diastolic PA and wedge pressure, which normally should be equal. But when diastolic PA in higher than is higher than wedge by seven millimeter of mercury, that also implies a precapillary pulmonary hypertension, and is at least as much of a valid assessment of precapillary uh, pulmonary circulation and hypertension than uh, PVR. So I hope everybody understands that. That's very important. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but there were, there is a number I want to give you. I guess I'll stop after that number. I talked a lot about cardiac output, but eventually what the tissues see, they don't see cardiac output. They see the systemic pressure. That's what the tissues see. If you have an eight in sepsis, you have an eight liter per minute cardiac output, but you have some maldistribution and some tissues are not seeing a good pressure at their local level. What's more important eventually is the ability of that karak output to match the peripheral vascular resistance. So you have karak output of six with a very depressed systemic vascular resistance. Uh, one, the pressure may be low and that does not provide good perfusion. Two, the heart is not working that hard to, to generate that karak output because the afterload is massively reduced. So it's a low cardiac power. It's an easy six liter per, per minute. So, the best way of assessing cardiac output in shock state is to use that additional equation, which is the, boss, the best correlate of prognosis in cardiogenic shock based on the shock trial, is to use cardiac power output, which is a multiplication of flow and pressure. Basically, it generates, it, it really integrates how well the heart not just pump flow, but how well it can pump flow against an uphill pressure. 
So ischemic output multiplies by the pressure that that ventricle has to overcome. And that's the cardiac power output. So it's the ability of the heart to pump against the peripheral vascular resistance. And it also correlates better with peripheral perfusion because it integrates the systemic pressure. The normal cardiac output, so it's cardiac output by systemic pressure divided by 451 to make the number one in a normal individual. So in a normal individual, this cardiac power output is one watt. And it increases, so it's energy rate, one watt, joule per second. And it increases if you run and so on with a stress to six watts. In a shock state, it should increase, yet paradoxically, by definition, it goes down and it's considered severely abnormal when less than 0.6. And it is used in all our algorithm of um, cardiogenic shock management. Another number I want you to know in cardiogenic shock. So in cardiogenic shock, beside all the cardiac output and PA sat and mixed venous sat we talked about, I want you to know cardiac power output and I want you to know PA pulsatility index, which is very much used to assess RV failure in cardiogenic shock, the RV component of a cardiogenic shock. So it's equal to PA pulse pressure divided by RA pressure. Pulse pressure is always a representation of forward output, of forward stroke volume, okay? So PA pulse pressure is a correlation of the RV stroke volume. The lower it is, the lower stroke volume. Always pulse pressure and stroke volume correlate. RA pressure is a correlate of the backward failure. So this is very much used. Normally it's over two to 2.5, it's called severe, very severe when it's less than one. Two to 2.5 predicts poor outcome in post LVAD patient. And those are cases where we need to consider RVAD or be ready to implant RVAD after LVAD. They have a high risk of RV failure afterward. It's also used in cardiogenic shock management to decide about placement of RV impella or ECMO. Um, so I will, uh, I think I will have to stop here. We'll go over more things in the future, uh, hopefully related to those stuff. Mm, any questions? Look at this definition of cardiogenic shock. This is a standard definition. Blood pressure and organ perfusion, uh, hypoperfusion, especially with lactate and clinical or radiographic congestion. Keep that in mind too, that's important. Any questions? No? Nothing so far. All right, well, thank you everybody. I will send you those slides and hopefully we'll go over uh, more things in the future. Thank you, Adriana. All right, thank you. See you later. Bye-bye.